And here's Yaz, Mike Yastrzemski, joining the Inside Giant Moments podcast presented by T-Mobile. Uh, really looking forward to talking to you. Uh, off to a great start with the year. Mike, how you doing? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Great, uh, great to have you. And thank you so much for doing it. I mean, look, I'd, I'd say what's gotten into you, but you did this last year as well. But that sophomore thing is kind of, uh, it's a thing. You know, people wonder, can you, can you do this again? You're off to a great start. So, so what's going on and how are you feeling? I'm um, just feeling good. You know, I think most of it is just happiness that baseball is back. You know, uh, being able to go out and play, even though we're not in front of the giant faithful fans, uh, we know they're watching at home. So we're just trying to uh, make the best of the situation. Were, were there were there doubts? What, what, what was the confidence level when you went into this offseason and you pictured the following year? What, what, what were what were the, the thoughts and, and the approach that you took? They, they weren't positive, I'll tell you that much. Uh, once once we saw the severity of this and how quickly it spread and how serious it was, um, I, I would joke around with my wife. I was just like, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to play baseball again. Um, like, I, I was that convinced about it. And so we, um, you know, it, it took some, some mental dexterity to kind of come back and get back into workouts and to to get ready again and I almost didn't let myself believe that it was actually going to happen uh just for the the fear of being let down of it getting shut down for the entire season and um so but here we are yeah so I mean it sounds like you were really wanting to play even though uh you didn't have any confidence in it but were there any discussions were there thoughts about um about not coming back on a personal level um, no, not not really. I mean, we, we talked about it briefly, but it was if we felt that it was safe enough to play, um, you know, that's that's what I've been wanting to do my whole life. And I finally got the chance to get a little taste of it last year and to to opt out, uh, you know, when I just really got my career started was not really much of an option for me. You know, I, I wonder, I mean, for you, this is all um, seemingly to the rest of us who haven't, you know, watched everything that you were doing since you were 18, but it seems like this all happened so fast. This time last year, you were just getting used to the idea of, of being a big leaguer and establishing yourself. And now here you are, uh, really, you've been the backbone of, of this offense, not only last year, but the, uh, the start of this year as well. So I think it's always impressive when someone can back it up once they once they do it once. The league has a has a scouting report on you now. So where where did this confidence come from? Um, just preparation, you know, going through my my daily routines and focusing on the little things that are going to help me be better, and really not being satisfied with last year. You know, obviously I'm happy about it and and very excited about it, but. Um, it's something that I want to grow on. It's not something that I want to look back and say like, oh, remember that one time I had a really good year in the big leagues? Like that was it. You know, I, I don't want that to be the case. And I don't ever want to feel comfortable. You know, I don't want to be in, in that situation where I think I have it figured out because um, this game has a really unique way of humbling you and it'll find you in the worst time and beat you down if you're not expecting it or not prepared for it. So um, just always being ready for that moment, I guess. Does the confidence ever waver? What's what, what what's that journey like for you? Uh, yeah, probably every day it wavers. <laughs> every every at bat it wavers. Uh, it's it's different every every second. Um, you know, depends on you know where how much sleep you got the night before, how much you know whether you were rushed in your routine, whether you drank enough coffee, uh, whether you've had enough water, you hydrated. Uh, every every little thing has some sort of um, effect on your game and your and your mentality going towards a game. So it's um, it it definitely wavers. That's for sure. How much is enough coffee? Um, I'd say two cups in the morning and one before the game. Okay, so on three. I mean, you can tell, like, if you get to the fourth inning or something and you're like, wow, I, I, I forgot to have my cup of coffee. Yeah, you're like, I need more caffeine, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I wanted to ask you this. I had the opportunity one time to talk to uh, Jerry Rice's son, who was also a wide receiver, and uh, his name is Jerry Rice Jr. And, and one of the things he talked about was the difficulty of carrying that name into the same sport where you have a, a legendary 
family member. And, and so I thought, I thought of you, like what, what has, has that been a burden? Like how would you describe carrying the Yastrzemski name through baseball? Um, honestly, it, it hasn't really felt weird to me. Um, I, I haven't had any burdens, you know, maybe there's been some attention in situations where people wouldn't be getting attention, but for me, it feels like it's been more of a blessing. Uh, you know, I probably got maybe a few more opportunities to stick around in, in the minors when, you know, I may not have been playing well. Um, you know, maybe there was somebody who looked at me and said, let's just give him one more chance because of my name. Um, if that's the case, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to have that. I, I'm not so sure if it is or not, but I'm guessing at, at some point that it may have been, you know, when I wasn't playing well or, you know, there was the fourth time that I'd gone back to double A or something like that. You know, one of those one of those things where um, I, I just don't know. But there hasn't been a whole lot of burden. Um, you know, the the only thing that may come is you may sign a few more autographs when you're not a superstar player. Um, you know, you have a superstar last name. But, um, you know, it's, it's things that I've been used to ever since I was a kid. By the way, in your autograph, I don't know if I've seen it. Like, how, which of the letters in that last name can you actually read? How, how many of them? The Y, the M and the Y, probably about <laughs> it. Maybe the I at the end. I don't know. <laughs> do, do you two talk shop at all? What, what does he say about your game? Yeah, we don't really, we don't really talk a whole lot of baseball when, when we're together. Um, it's usually golfing or fishing. Um, but – you know, when we do talk about it, it's more or less about swing thoughts and um, it's more of a mentality, you know, not really a whole lot of mechanics anymore because he's let me go on my own swing journey and let me develop into the player that I wanted to be, which I couldn't have asked for anything more, you know, to have somebody who has so much knowledge and so much history and credit in the game. Um, he didn't force me to to try and be a certain type of player. He just really helped me try and learn my, my baseball IQ and my mentality. So when it came to, to talking shop, it was more, you know, how to be aggressive, how to stay confident, how to – honestly, how to take a break from the game when you need it. Um, and so those are, those are the really important things that keep you in the game for a lot longer than most people. What are your swing thoughts? Hit the ball hard. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I don't, I don't really get very mechanical during the season. I, I really try to stay away from it because my personal opinion is that if you, if you hit the ball hard, you're doing your job. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter where the pitch is. Um, you know, you watch Donnie's home run from a couple nights ago. Uh, you know, the sinker inside, it was five inches off the plate. You know, is somebody going to go and tell him like, hey, Donnie, you shouldn't have swung at that pitch. Like, no, it was a free run home run that tied the game. So, but if you're in practice and thinking mechanically, you're going to say, oh, you know, you're, don't swing at this pitch or swing, swing with your hands a certain way or, you know, it, all that goes out the window when it's time to compete. What do you think about being a leadoff hitter? That's great. Um, you know, I, I get the most at bats on the team, hopefully. That's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping for, you know. So, um, I'm, I'm always want, wanting to be at the plate. I find myself, like, itching to hit when, when I'm – six batters away I'm like all right can I hit yet no oh god I gotta wait even longer I just want to I want to go hit that's all I want to do <laughs> have you ever let off at a, at a different point in your career did you ever foresee that um yeah I did in the minors a lot um okay. I, I hit lead off um let's see probably starting in 2015 and then as I progressed and got up into higher ranks of of, of the minor leagues I started going back and forth between, you know, hitting leadoff or hitting second, hitting anywhere from fifth to ninth. Um, you know, it's just all over the place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, this, this team, um, and we got a small sample size, and you've had a trip to Colorado, but, I mean, this team seems to be getting uh, easier run production than, than it did last year. Why, why do you think that is? Um, I, honestly, the – the guys have been working really hard, but I, I do want to give a lot of credit to our new hitting coaches. Um, the way that they help us game plan for each individual pitcher and for each individual player, we all have our own game plans that we can stick to, we can trust, and we don't have to go up there kind of blank without any information. So it's been, it's been awesome. 
you know, I think fans have a lot of questions um, about any new coaching staff. And it seems like there are so many coaches. So that's an interesting comment you make. Like, is, is, is the game planning for each hitter a little different this year than, than it was last year? Yeah, it is. Um, they, they use different verbiage and they have um, honestly a, a, unique, a unique thought process to the way that they use the new numbers, let's say. So with all the, the pitching metrics and all these vertical and horizontal breaks and all this really confusing stuff, they simplify it. And they kind of let us know what that means and how we should approach how we should hit them. You know, it's going to be different facing a guy who throws 92 that has a lot of ride to it so it's going to look like the ball's almost rising versus a guy who throws 97 with sink um there you know so instead of just telling us the guy throws 95 or 98 or 86 whatever it may be um they're telling us what the shape looks like and then they're reproducing it in practice so they actually take the the numbers and they try and match it up on a machine so that way we can see what the actual breaking ball looks like before the game Wow. Wow. That's fascinating. It is. That's fascinating. The way that this is, uh, this has changed. I mean, it's almost like uh, virtual reality now leading <laughs> you to, I mean, you're having your at bats almost before you're at bats. Yeah. Yep. That is true. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. I, I think Giants fans are so fascinated with the way you were acquired because um, you, you've been so good uh, right away upon arrival um, but it was, you know, considered kind of a, an unknown transaction at the time. Have you ever had a, a conversation with Farhan Zaidi or, or anyone in terms of what they saw in you when, when they got you? Not really. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with Farhan, but that, <laughs> that hasn't been one of them. Um, that's, that's one of those things where uh, it's like, yeah, that would be a cool conversation to have, but maybe I don't want to have it. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, like – <laughs> having some back, like, yeah, you know, we snagged you just, we thought you'd be like a good, like maybe backup guy that could like go up and down all the time. I don't know. And then it just happened. Uh, no. So that's, uh, it is funny to think about, but I think I'll stay away from that one. Just yeah. in case, just in case. What, what did they tell you when they acquired you about anything? Um, that I had to be on a flight in about 10 hours <laughs> and pack up all your stuff. Um, just that they were excited to have me and I was going to have like three or four days in spring training to meet everyone before I hopefully made the triple a team. You know, that was, that was yeah. kind of it. You know, uh, and I sort of made reference to this earlier. We see a lot of players go through, whether it's a sophomore slump or just an adjustment when a league starts to understand who they are and, and how to get them out. I wonder how you've handled that evolution. Like what have you noticed the league is trying to do to get you out and how have you handled it? Um, I've noticed that guys are really trying to just make pitches against me, um, trying to nibble on the corners and not, not miss over the plate. And so I've just become more patient and really understanding that the strikes and balls are for umpires, you know, they're not, they're not for players. And so to, to think about that and say, you know, it's, it's okay if I go down 0-2, I'm not, I'm not worried about it because I don't, I don't care about striking out, you know, it doesn't doesn't matter. You're still trying to get a pitch that you can help the team win on. So if they happen to make three good pitches, you just tip your hat and say, all right, I'll get you next time when you make a mistake. Yeah. Uh, and that, that type of relaxation kind of creates that freedom to, to really attack your pitch. So. Is this the first time you felt that in your career? Like it feels like that would come from, you know, some sort of job security. Um, a little bit, you know, a little bit is that. And also a little bit is, kind of having the confidence and belief that I can impact the team. And that comes from last year, you know, knowing that I can not help this team win and I, I do belong in the big leagues. Um, those are kind of little, little humps that you have to get over mentally on your own at some point. Um, you're one of the very few everyday players on this team and, and with the, the approach that they, uh, that they have, what, what does that mean to you? That's what I've always wanted. You know, it's, it's incredible. And I, I tell them every day, I was like, I don't, I don't want to take anything for granted. I don't want to miss a single pitch. I want to play as much as I possibly can. Uh, I think that just comes from knowing that at some day it's going to be over, you know, and I, I want to take as much of this opportunity as I possibly can and just run with it. 
I think there's an assumption from a lot of fans, maybe media too, that, that players um, at times get frustrated with all the positional movement and the platooning and because everybody does want to be out there. And I'm sure there is a natural frustration to it, but we also hear a lot of you guys talk about the communication of Gabe Kapler. You already were talking about the things that you really love about the staff. How would you characterize the communication that, that Kapler and the staff have with you guys on a day-to-day -day basis about that stuff? It's great. You know, you, you're always welcome to go into Cap's office and talk to him, to any of the coaches, and they're not going to throw a bunch of BS your way. Um, they're not going to kind of lead you down one road and then, you know, feed you something different by the time you get to the end of it. So it's, it's kind of nice to, to have that clarity and know where you stand and know, you know, if you have a day off, you know when you're probably going to be coming into the game if you're going to or if you're going to have the entire day off. Um, all of it is just kind of an open book. I definitely wanted to get to this. Uh, you've addressed it a little bit. I'd love to, I'd love to hear you expand. You, you opted, um, you know, throughout the year during the, uh, the national anthem to, uh, to take a knee. What, what went into that decision for you? Um, just, a, it was honestly, it was a long process. Um, I originally didn't understand it when Kaepernick first started. And by the time that it started becoming very apparent to me that there was a real systematic problem going on, um, I felt that it was time for me to stop ignoring it and to actually – kind of do do some little part um you know and one of my best friends Tony Kemp is actually one of the reasons that um I have fallen you know into my opinion so strongly is um you know we never were aware of how lucky we were to be born with white skin you know that that never occurred to me that never because when we're in our comfort zone and we're never challenged or never have any fear we never experience other people's perspectives and so when I started experiencing the other perspective I, I decided that I was no longer going to be you know silent about it and I wanted it to be known that I am in support of you know of making things right for everyone and making sure that the constitution is upheld and that just says that everyone is a is a free human being in our country and and that's something that I strongly believe in and I felt that I needed to show that my support of our country is by doing my part. And I felt that that was the most respect that I could give to the flag is to show that I'm willing to, to go out there and put myself on a limb to uphold what they're fighting for. And that's for our freedom. A thoughtful answer, man. Bravo. Uh, love it. All right. Let's, uh, we're going to move in now to a, a short segment we call behind the mask. So these are three specific questions that everyone who comes on now answers about just the current state of affairs. First one, uh, what is the strangest thing you've experienced through all of this uh, that is going on with baseball right now? Not being able to play cards. Ah, yeah. On the, something you know, something that we, or, yeah. Something that we kind of take for granted in the locker room, on the plane. Like you can't really, you just can't do it. You can't be like touching cards and passing them around to other people. So, I mean, uh, what is the plane flight like? It's quiet. <laughs> like you can't even you can't get up to go talk to your friends and your teammates. You have to sit in your seat the whole time with a mask on, and the only time you're allowed to get up is to go to the bathroom. Golly, man! All right, second one. Um, other than baseball, what's gotten you through this time? Um, golf. Definitely golf. Um, that was one of the things that I was lucky enough to be able to do while we were home because the golf courses stayed open and. You just walk and you stay your own, your own distance from everybody, and it was great. What's uh, what's the handicap, by the way? Uh, it it was it's like a five right now. Okay, that's that's yeah. that's a player. How do you keep from bringing the baseball swing to the golf course and the golf swing to the baseball field? I golf right-handed. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> do you yeah. really? And you're a five. Yeah. <laughs> How did you, how did you make that decision? I, it was my dad's decision, actually. I uh, I used to hit with his clubs when I was a little kid. I hit him lefty, and he golfed right-handed. So I'd hit him off the back, and then by the time I wanted to start hitting a driver, 
I would dent the back of his driver. So he's like, screw that. I'm not buying new clubs because you want to swing one way. Like you're going to swing right-handed. And so he taught me to hit righty. Oh man. So golf it is. What, any, any yoga with, uh, with your wife? I know she's, yep. uh, she's big into it. Yeah. Lots of yoga with my wife. Um, she is an instructor. So that is, uh, that's very easy for me to be able to hop on and uh, didn't have to go to any classes or anything like that. Didn't have to sign up for um, any online workouts or anything like that. I just had them all at home. Love it. Uh, okay, last one. What part of the new protocol around baseball would you like to keep forever? Getting the $40 a day for room service. <laughs> I'd like to keep that so I don't have to keep paying for it. <laughs> you get a room service stipend now? Yep, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we should all travel that way. That's pretty good. Exactly. Uh, uh, oh, that's good. I love it. All right. Uh, let's hear about this. And, and you and I talked about it on the, uh, on the show um, when it happened. But uh, your first ever splash hit uh, last week, the walk-off. But mm -hmm. no fans are in the building to, to make that, you know, maybe everything that it would have been. So how did that experience differ with no one there? It was still – exhilarating you know being it any anytime you hit a walk-off even if it's a, a single double home or whatever it is like you you solidified the win for the team that day so there's no better high um just had a blast doing it obviously would love to do it in front of fans but um to to have your first splash hit be a, a walk-off is pretty cool have you guys in general certainly you personally have there been any adjustments that you've had to make? And this can be because of the lack of fans or, or any other part of the protocol or the, or the current reality. Um, you know, what adjustments have you had to make because of the differences this year? Um, honestly, it's usually when there's fans and there's a, a ton of people there watching, you may feel a little more pressure. So you need to relieve that pressure like in the dugout and, you know, joke around with your teammates to lighten the mood. Um, it's almost the opposite. It's almost like I need to, like when I'm in the dugout, I obviously we have to keep our distance, but that kind of helps keep the focus. Um, so if I'm joking around too much, there's this weird fine line. Um, like if I'm messing around in the dugout right now, it's like I'm kind of taking away from the game because there's no really distraction when you're actually on the field. But when you're playing in front of 40,000 people and it's so intense on the field, you kind of need to tone it back so you can be loose and fresh. And so that's kind of like the opposite almost. Wow. That's really interesting. I never would have thought of that. So just kind of that, um, that uh, you tell me the right word. Is it the, the pressure, the energy that's created from the fans, not yeah, being there allows kind of a, a calmer, a calmer dugout experience. Yeah. It's almost like the, the lack of intensity from an external force is, is not there. So you have to kind of make sure that you create it within yourself during the game, as opposed to the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I feel that that's interesting. Um, how do you guys all feel uh, when you see, and we've seen it a couple of times There's another game postponed. I know uh, today when, when you see the you know, outbreaks or positives on, on other teams, and if it does come out that it, it's because guys were breaking protocol or whatever, I wonder how the rest of the league looks at it. Because especially a guy like you, you have not, uh, at least not yet, made generational wealth. And, and so this is, you know, this is everybody's paycheck on the line. So how do you guys feel about that? Um, you know, at least I can only speak for myself in, in those terms. But I just, you know, I hope that everybody's just staying safe and staying smart because I think it's foolish to – to take this virus lightly you know obviously it's it's shown how quickly it can spread and the damage that it can do and you know you just don't want to spread it to other people like it's it's one thing if you have no care to catch it yourself but being careless and spreading it to other people is is one thing that I would never want to do myself I wouldn't want to be the reason that somebody else who's being very cautious and really doesn't want to catch it um, I'd feel very bad if I were the reason that they got it so those are kind of the thought processes that I have in terms of, you know, staying, staying inside and not breaking protocol and really taking it seriously. You know, the, the paychecks is one thing, obviously that's, that's a side of it and a, a big side of it, but um, people's health is more important. You know, if somebody's really cautious and is very adamant about being safe, it's, 
feel like it's just rude to to not even take their feelings or their stances into account. Is that a discussion that you guys as a group have had? And I, I wonder kind of what, what leadership responsibilities you've taken uh, now that you are, you know, you're one of the mainstays of this lineup. Yeah, we have had those talks. Um, and mostly it's, it's along the same, same lines. It's don't ruin it for someone else. Um, we don't want to be, you know, there are guys that are getting to experience the big leagues for the first time and guys that need the paychecks and guys that, that don't too, you know, there's, there's all sorts of angles from this because there's 750 guys that are playing right now. And so what we need to do is just kind of think about each other and say, you know, if, if this guy is in the big leagues for the first time and he may never have another chance to play in the big leagues, then we need to make sure that they can experience that for as long as possible. Or same thing with the guy who may be on their last leg. You know, this may be – people may retire after this year and they should be able to enjoy their season. And whether or not there's fans or not, they should still have, you know, whatever they, whatever they want out of it. Um, let's look to your future a little bit, um, both, you know, baseball and, and personally. Um, again, such an interesting story being a, a late bloomer. You know, I think about your particular position, and, and I mean, you're turning 30 in two weeks, right? I mean, yeah. 30 in two weeks, and uh, you're still just kind of getting started, and the whole arbitration process is still ahead of you. So uh, how, how does that feel, the way that this has fallen? Yeah, Mark, thanks for reminding me. That was awesome. <laughs> what, a, what a great thing. Um, no, you know what? It's, it's one of those things that I'm – I'm never ashamed of the process that I took to get here or my path. Um, all I ever wanted when I was a kid was to play in the big leagues. And there's no shame in making your debut when you're 29. You know, it's still, it's still as cool as if you make your debut when you're 18. Um, you know, you still get the exact same exhilaration, the same thrill. Um, yeah, sure, you may not play as long, but – uh, I, I never really had these goals of saying I wanted to play for 30 years in the big leagues or, you know, break any of these records. I just wanted to be a big leaguer. And so to be able to achieve that dream is, is really all that's important. Birthday parties are tough during a pandemic, by the way. You got any plans for 30? They are. No, I don't. I told my wife I wanted her to buy me a boat. And then I switched to a car and then I switched to a golf membership. So I don't know. We'll see which one she comes up with. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's good. <laughs> Uh, you know, gosh, it's been, what, 14 months since your debut, about, right? Does that, that sound mm -hmm. about right? I mean, yep. how, how have these last 14 months changed your outlook on, on the rest of your life? It literally changed my life. Um, I, I was able to buy a house when the only thing that I was worried about was paying for groceries for the off season. You know, I, I didn't have to, to grind in a cage and give lessons to, to kids for – five hours a night. Um, yeah, it's my wife doesn't have to work four jobs anymore. She just works one or two because she does yoga and she works for a, um, a medical sales company. So it's it's just those things that, you know, I always hoped for were kind of came to fruition. And it was it was very, very satisfying. So great. Um, you know, I keep saying, uh, gosh, you're, you know, you're a young guy in the game. I, I refer to you as a late bloomer. I wonder if you feel all those things. Like, I mean, do you <laughs> feel like you're new or do you feel like you've been at this for a long time? I, I do feel, I do still feel young, you know, like that's, that's what's so cool about this is even though, you know, some people may look at my age and say he's older. Um, yeah, that's true. But I, I'm a young spirit, I feel like. And I, I feel like my body is still young, so there are, uh, you know, there's there's some good things to being a late bloomer too. You know, we're looking at some pretty good numbers right now. Do you feel like this is the best version of you, or or what what could we still see out of you as an individual player? I don't know. Hopefully more. You know, that's that's always the that's always the goal as you as you start to. This is one thing that I've noticed too is like you have these what you expect to be crazy lofty goals when you're a young kid, right? So playing the big leagues it's a long shot right so then I made it to the big leagues and it's like okay well now I guess I have to change my goals right like now it's to now it's to be an everyday player and then like once you get there it's like okay well I have to readjust goals like I need to I need to constantly keep growing and so um I just 
I'm just so happy to be in a position where I'm playing baseball and the only thing that we're trying to do is win baseball games. You know, you don't, you don't really have that in the minor leagues. It's always some ul ulterior motive. You know, there's some, but you know, you want to move up, you want to make more money, you want to do this. Like now it's just, I just want to win games. That's, that's all I want to do. Is there a new goal out there in the back of your mind? Make the all-star team or something? No, uh, yeah. it, it doesn't really matter to me. I, I want to win as many games as we possibly can because there's nothing more fun than winning baseball games in the big leagues. It, it, there's just not. Well, and the team is off to a very competitive start. What, what do you believe this team can, can achieve? I mean, I think we can make it to the playoffs, you know, and I think that's our goal is to, to be playing as long as we possibly can. And when we – I mean, you guys saw it a little bit. When we get things rolling, we're, we're good and we're going to surprise some people. And, you know, I hope people think that we're not good. You know, I hope that teams expect that from us. And then we show up and we surprise them and, and then we leave with more wins than we do losses. Well, especially with the expanded playoffs, I mean, the possibilities are, are really out there for a lot of teams. Is that something you guys all talk about? Yeah, um, it, it's something that, um, you know, Hunter has done a really good job of being that guy. He's the visionary, you know, like he's he's Mr. Positive. He's got all these these good thoughts and he's inspirational and he keeps guys thinking that way. And he's he's big on on manifesting our own destiny. And if we believe it, then we can do it. Uh, where is your optimism currently sitting of, uh, of just making it to the end of the season with everything going on? I think it's pretty good. You know, I, we, we had some protocol adjustments, and I think that guys are understanding how, how serious it is when one person on the team gets it by seeing it from the Marlins and the Cardinals. You know, nobody wants to be the next, the next name on SportsCenter that says that, you know, this team has to sit out for – six days, 10 days, 14 days, whatever it is. No, nobody wants to do that. Um, so I think that those experiences have actually kind of helped us. And the fact that nobody really had any serious complications or was extremely sick was um, very lucky for us. Mike Yastrzemski on the Inside Giant Moments podcast presented by T-Mobile. Bud, this was great. I really appreciate your time. Fun to have you. Absolutely, Mark. Thanks for having me, man.